benefit when there are more funds directed into scholarships and resources. The Office of Diversity operates as an entity that has the administration and university needs at the forefront of the mind. Students come at a convenience. I have felt unsupported and bamboozled in a sense. When I once visited the office and talked at length about how there needed to be more money placed within the scholarships housed by the Office of Diversity, I was met with the promise that it was being addressed. It has not been. It feels extremely disingenuous when a student goes out of their way to meet with administration, an admin in her letter, as she puts it, to express concerns and their input is ignored. Students do not feel supported by their administration. Students do not feel con connected to many of the individuals who make some of the biggest decisions regarding student needs. There is no reason that students should not be should be there is no reason students should be able to discern that many of the individuals that work in admin do not actually like students. Let me say that again. There is no reason that students should be able to discern that their admin doesn't like their students. Do not actually like their students or even work alongside them. It is apparent as actions speak much louder than words. Accountability is necessary. As an office of diversity that focuses mostly on how to make the university appear more diverse and accepting isn't being utilized correctly, in my opinion. The work being done in the resource centers are essential, is essential and deserve the highest praise. I believe it's necessary to question why aren't they better supported? Respectfully, Rebecca Flower, University of Louisville SGA President for College of Arts and Sciences and Martin Luther King Scholar at the University of Louisville. Mr. Fraser, you have your own comments to add. Thank you. What a queer situation that we're in. We're here today joined by colleagues on all sides of the political spectrum. Our details are different, but the tell is quite the same, that these offices are not working for students. They are not supporting student success. They are not directly engaging with these students. Now, we have to be persnickety with our words because the misnomer of DEI, DEI offices, regardless of the good intent of these officers, and I do want to be clear, the people that are in OID or DEI offices usually come in and they do have the best intent, but the issue is the structure of these offices. It's the intent of these offices as well, and I think that this gets into other purposes. But when it comes to actually looking at student support and the structure of these offices, we're seeing not only in the metrics as qualified by the Council for Post-Secondary Education, but also the experiences of students, how they're not directly supporting services. So let's be persnickety with terms. We're talking about the offices. Just like in the committee sub in SB6, for SB6, we are not talking about the resources, resource centers. Representative Decker, you have no interest of banning the resource centers, correct? Correct. We're not banning scholarships, in fact, all scholarships, we cannot find a race-exclusive scholarship with the exception of maybe one university. All scholarships like the Martin Luther King Scholarship at the University of Louisville, also scholarships at the University of Kentucky, Office of LGBT and so forth, are open to all students. This bill would not impact it because they are open to all. We're not here to ban academic freedom, correct? So long as a course meets free inquiry, if we engage in much what is in here in the discussion, that is not DEI. We're talking about the offices that have been used to veneer, as a veneer on campus and sterilize the concern of students, particularly some of most Kentucky's most marginalized and oppressed students. We saw the rise of DEI offices because as talking to students and as I have went on tour, and I do have to make a comment I still plan on continuing this tour, regardless or if this bill passes, because we need to hear these concerns. If there's been one true thing, we need to listen to students more. So these offices to used, we do have a problem on our campuses. These offices aren't helping our problems on our campuses. There is racism. 
There's queer phobia. There's phobias on our campuses. There's harassment. There's discrimination. There's discrimination against thought. There's discrimination against religion. We have a problem. But instead of whitewashing and giving a veneer on these campuses to misdirect students, instead of the offices such as Title IX, Title VII, which this bill doesn't impact, we want to support. Instead of giving, we want to support these students. If something happens on campus, if discrimination happens, we want students to speak out and be legitimately heard. That is not a DEI offices. So what is DEI? It's the makeshift offices that are used to enforce bias incident response teams that are unconstitutional. UK, UofL, and I also believe WKU has one as well, where students are brought in and told that if they don't believe, think, and say a certain thing that may go against st certain standards in which are decided, certain things that goes against free thought and student expression, that it may cost them letters of recommendation, it may cost them jobs that which is part of the committee hearing that we the part of the hearing that we heard in committee testimony on the version of SB six in the Senate. Well that works both ways. And we've heard students, including diverse students, say that if they don't if if you speak truth to power, if you speak on these problems, that we might not be able to consider you for jobs. You're causing problems to the institution when you speak out against racism. We might need to watch that. In fact, this has happened at the University of Kentucky when a student tried to hang out banner talking about racism on campus in 2019. So we see the cut of the sword. We see the sword cut both ways on this situation. And that's the reason why we have such, and in my opinion, quite the diverse coalition when it comes to this. And we do have individuals when it comes to free thought, free expression, and we need representation as well because student voices do matter and they do need to speak. And I'm so proud of Representative Decker for taking the time to actually go visit these offices, to talk to these students and hear these concerns and work with the best intentions and also have that reflected in the bill. Again, and as anybody who has worked with institutional diversity or in diverse in diversity and trying to promote equality on campuses we all know the phrase talk is cheap show us in paper well it's in the paper folks i as i said i'm here speaking on be, in my personal capacity but i also speak from my experience from the university of kentucky i have a unique experience as a non-traditional first generation gay student um, and also uniquely, or as some people may say, as not so uniquely, or shouldn't be, as a gay Republican. We have, I get to, uh, while we might have differences, I have a unique perspective in the sense that I have my foot on both sides of the equation. I get to hear these perspectives. And I have to say that hearing perspectives of students, and also from perspectives of DEI officers, who are saying that when they come to what they believe is to be the dream job, to actually make social impact, when they believe that they're in the position to actually cause social change and to address some of the nefarious issues that we see on campuses, from students being called the F word down Columbia, or at, at SACS, the student record, at, uh, at the Student Recreation Center at the University of Louisville when somebody drives down and says the N word, when a transgender student is being harassed at the University of Louisville by a fraternity, when a student needs assistance when it comes to witnessing or dealing with a friend having suicide at the University, at Western Kentucky University, these students aren't being supported. Because when we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about marginalized students, we're talking about disabled students, veteran students. And I've had the unique opportunity to be able to hear these students from all perspectives and I have to say that our campuses have been failing, these students. So I look forward to the question, and I, I do urge this committee to review the language. Talk to students, not administrators. And look at how we can better support these institutions, support the resource centers who have been called, quote, the angels on campus. That's where the money needs to be going, not the veneers to whitewash and sterilize issues on campus. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Representative Decker, uh, Mr. Frazier, 
We have several citizens who have signed up to speak. If you all could leave the table, uh, we'll bring these individuals up. The first person I'm going to call up is Mr. Travis Powell from the Council for Post-Secondary Education. <clears throat> Mr. Powell, please introduce yourself for the record. There we go. Travis Powell, I'm Vice President and General Counsel for the Council on Post-Secondary Education. Please raise your right hand. You swear a firm testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. You please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Tipton, members of the committee. I um, want to first off take the opportunity to uh, uh, thank Representative Decker um, for our conversations that we've had on this legislation. Uh, we started our conversations back in January on the on discussions on the bill, and um, I have really uh, appreciated the dialogue that we've been able to have. Uh, we haven't always agreed, but I provided comments to the bill. Um, some of those uh, uh, were in, in the revised version. Uh, we didn't agree on the big concepts, and perhaps I could have been more persuasive, but, uh, but when we talk, I heard a lot of today talking about free debate and free exchange of ideas, and uh, Representative Decker and I definitely had that, and I appreciate uh, her engagement on this process. You know, at CPE, we are, um, and President Thompson, who, who couldn't be here today, is traveling on business, uh, is uh, statutorily the chief advisor for higher education uh, for the General Assembly and the governor, and we take that responsibility very seriously on all issues. And obviously, you know, as you might expect, we are uh, speaking in opposition of this bill on behalf of CP and all the universities and, and KCTCS institutions in the state. Uh, but we are advisors to the General Assembly, and we always pr tr try to provide good feedback uh, whenever asked, no matter what the issue. So anyway, again, I appreciate your time, Representative Decker. Um, when we talk about DEI, at least at CP and how we define it, we define it as a, in a very broad way, and it's very simple. Um, it is simply finding folks from different backgrounds, uh, marginalized backgrounds or any backgrounds that they might be from, and helping them to be more successful in their college uh, pursuits, whatever that be, whether that be a four-year degree, whether that be a technical degree, we want to get the students the supports they need in order to be successful, and that's how we define DEI. It's not about any kind of ideology um, or any kind of uh, uh, adherence to any ideology uh, on any side of the political spectrum or otherwise. We just want to get the folks the help they need in order to be successful, and I think we've done that through, our, through what we consider to be DEI. And again, definitions matter, but I will tell you from our perspective in DEI, since 2012, we are really moving the needle on this, and we're going to have to do this as a state if we're going to meet our 60 by 30 goal and getting 60% uh, 60 of our uh, working age population with a credential that matters by 2030. Because we have 20% of our population right now that are underrepresented students, and we have to serve those students well. And I really think that we have when we get them into the system. So just some data to tell you, over uh, since 2012 and 2013, retention rates for all students have gone up 9.5% at uh, KCTCS institutions and 6%. Uh, that's first to second year retention has gone up 6, uh, six percentage points um, at all institutions, at all, for all students. But for URM students, it's gone up 13.5 percentage points at KCTCS institutions and 8.6 percentage points at, at four-year institutions. And for low-income students, which, again, we include in our definition of diversity, low-income students, 8.5 percent uh, percentage points increase for KCTCS institutions and 7.7 percentage point increases for four-year institutions. Our graduations have risen, tr rates have tr risen tremendously. That's our six-year and three-year graduation rates for our four-year institutions and our uh, community and technical colleges overall have gone up 20 percentage points for KCTCS institutions and 10 percentage points for four-year institutions and our low-income and underrepresented minority populations have gone up even more than that. So, and we attribute this at least in partial part to our DEI efforts. It is moving the needle, but we are having a really hard time getting those folks into the pipeline. As you all know, and, as, and, and in this committee knows, and here's so many issues around uh, K-12 education, we, our students are not persisting into college at the rate that we want them to. They're at, it, the rate has dropped below 50%. So we have to have all the tools in the tool bag in order to help all our students be successful in Kentucky. And I'm afraid that this legislation may limit us in being able to do the things we need for students because it talks about differential treatment of students based on race, sex, national origin, that sort of thing. Um, and we treat students differently on those bases because they are different on those bases. And, we, and it's not in a way to discriminate against the other students that are not, but it's a way to provide additional support to those students that meet those criteria in order to help them to be successful. We're, it's about an all ships rise kind of 
proposition for CP in all our campuses. And it's never been a handout. It's always been a hand up for our institutions, uh, for our students at our institutions. We simply can't afford to leave anybody behind at any of our campuses. And we'll do everything we can in order to be, help them to be successful. And we fear that this legislation may limit that in some form or fashion, even if those resource centers still uh, exist. We can't promote or provide differential treatment to individuals based on the differences that we know that they have that could very severely limit us in being able to do the things we need in order to help them to be successful. Um, and just a few things that I'll mention that I, that I worry about with this legislation. And number one, I worry about students getting the supports they need to be successful, as I've already mentioned, and I'm worried that this may limit this. The, this bill has a significant regulatory component to it. It is, it is a, the committee substitute is very long. There's a lot of pages on, to, for institutions to look through on how to comply as a, as a general counsel, not to an agency, but to CPE to have to figure out how to, this is gonna play out on our campuses and how to actually apply it in order to be, order to be uh, in compliance with the legislation and all the reporting requirements that are involved, all the exceptions that are listed to discriminatory concepts. For example, there are 19 exceptions to the application of uh, the Section 1 that prohibits DEI initiatives and DEI offices on our campuses. And within the DEI initiatives, there are 14 exceptions. So there are so many two exceptions to the rule, trying to figure out which ones we're ha we need to apply, which ones we don't, which, which ones does the federal law require, which ones do they, don't, do they not require. Uh, is is what we're doing, can we do something else that maybe would comply, that would more comply with the legislation that this has passed, that would also comply with the legislation? These are questions that we're going to have to answer at our campuses, and with the fear of being sued for these, uh, uh, with the increased, uh, with the private right of action that's created by this legislation, too. Uh, so that's a concern I have is on the compliance side. I also worry about the chilling effect that this, <clears throat> that this may have on our recruitment and retention of, of underrepresented students. Regardless of what the legislation says, if anti-DEI legislation is passed in Kentucky, I'm worried that it might turn students away or might send them out of state that might feel like this would mean that they wouldn't be welcome on our campuses. Now, we can have the conversation about how we that's not the case and they are welcome on our campuses and the legislation doesn't prohibit us from welcoming them and making it an inclusive place but i'm concerned that that it may have a chilling effect on those individuals so that's another concern and then finally um uh, again i worry about the private right of action at, for our campuses any waiver of sovereign immunity for our campuses is something that we always uh, do not support um, and worried about them having to defend lawsuits. Again, there's a lot of nuances in this bill and how it's gonna be applied, and I'm afraid that that could result in a lot of lawsuits that our institution would have to defend um, in, and in compliance with this, and really taking the focus away from, again, like I said before, helping students to be successful. That's what we're really focused on, and I can't say to a T, and I, and I certainly, uh, you know, the students that have testified on this bill, students that testified on Senate bill, uh, on the Senate bill and Senate education, I don't discount their experience at all, but that's not what we're about. If there's an interest in, you know, prohibiting ideological proliferation or adherence to any ideology or that sort of thing for employees, contractors, students, that kind of thing, um, you know, go in that direction. That's really the goal, but don't take away the resources from these, uh, uh, from our offices to help the students to be more successful. Um, and the one thing that I will mention that I do support in this bill is the uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Uh, that's something that I think, you know, in a positive manner, that's something I think we can focus on. I can tell you at CPE, as part of our uh, DEI policy, we want to double down on that aspect. We want to make sure that students aren't shouted down for any of their ideas, that they feel comfortable in order to express their opinions, whether those be conservative, liberal, in whatever circumstances they are. And they've, we've got to work in a way to make our civil discourse better in, on our college campuses, because that's going to proliferate uh, uh, when they leave our campuses and go out into the world. Free discussion is uh, of utmost importance and debate on our college campuses and anything that we can do at CP to support that. So the extent that that's in this bill, we certainly support that. Um, but anyway, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'll be around for questions if anybody has them. Appreciate that, Mr. Powell. Thank you. We have 12 individuals on the list signed up to speak. Uh, the way I'm going to ask you to do this, we've got three chairs up here, so I'm going to ask three people to come up at a time to try and expedite the process. Uh, the first three people I have is Kimberly Kennedy, Felicia Newman, and Dr. Trinidad Jackson. If the three of you all would come forward, please. Uh, the microphone's in front of you. Make sure the button is pushed and a green light is on. 
and please make sure those microphones are pulled close to you. Sometimes it's difficult uh, for people to hear. And due to the number of people uh, who have signed up, I'm going to ask you all, each of you, if you could limit your comments to three minutes or less. But begin with, please identify yourself for the record. Then I will minister the oath. Felicia, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Felicia Newman, Louisville Urban League. Kimberly Kennedy. Dr. Trinidad Jackson, a Please. private citizen, but also, what was that? Can, uh, okay, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. A private citizen and also KFTC member. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. yes. Please proceed. Whoever wants to go first, thank you. Um, my name is Felicia Newman. I am the Director for Policy and um, Justice at the Louisville Urban League. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the Louisville Urban League and our president and CEO, Lyndon Pryor. The Louisville Urban League vehemently opposes Senate Bill 6. This bill will claw back all the progress we've made here in the Commonwealth. It will render higher education uh, students less competitive in a global economy, and it will uh, have our, them be less educated than their peers. This bill is bad for our students, it's bad for higher education, it's bad for the economy, and it's bad for the Commonwealth. I know only have three minutes, but I want to tell you a little story about my mother who was born in the 1950s. My mother told my sister and I stories of segregation. My mother told us stories of being denied food at a lunch counter when she was with her class on a class field trip. My mother told me stories of colored water fountains, colored bathrooms, um, sundown towns, and racial hatred. These things are important and they are of a legacy in my family and I'm a Kentuckian. These stories need to be told and these stories need to be talked about. These stories also are, are <clears throat> a part of the, the legacy of the entire United States. We, just as the people from Harlan County can celebrate and t t pull stories from when they fought for union rights, the stories that, that make all this Commonwealth a complete and complete history of our state. <clears throat> I hope that um, this bill does not have the unintended consequences of preventing young black athletes from coming to Kentucky. There are calls from pro athletes of all races to stop coming to states that will make these uh, young men feel uncomfortable. You all love the UK cats, I know you do. <laughs> And if we in, 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 uh, in enter this, this type of realm where we will alienate those young athletes, is that something we really want to do? There was a mention of how much these DEI programs cost. I looked it up while I was sitting in the back there. Calipari makes $8.53 million. And his five assistant coaches total $2.425 million. I think that's about $10 million. So why don't we cut the athletics program to put a fourth um, scholarships for students? These, these ideas don't really go together. The scholarships for students and the DEI program. We need to increase Pell Grants. That's how you get more money to students. I want to also uh, remind you that there are so many books out there that it sounds like to me, if this legislation gets passed, maybe they won't be able to be taught anymore. We have books on slavery called Roots. We have books on the indigenous people on Wounded Knee. We have books on the bombing of Japanese citizens in Hiroshima. We have books on the Holocaust and their book called Night. This, these topics make people feel psychological distress as you have listed in your bill. This makes people feel shame, guilt, discomfort. How are we going to have a prosperous commonwealth, a well-educated populace, stop the brain drain from this state if we do not highly educate our students on things that are sh uh, distressing or shameful or guilty? Make them feel guilt. Diversity and equity inclusion does not teach anything outlined in this bill. It doesn't teach any of that. It does not teach people that are inherently racist. It doesn't teach people that are inherently sexist. And it does not teach that anyone is irredeemable. In fact, Ms. It, Newman, your three minutes are up. Okay, can I, just, can I just say one last thing? Briefly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I want to remind everyone um, that Timothy II, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 
um, verse 7, chapter 1, tells us that God has created us in a spirit, not in fear and timidity, but in out of power, love, and self-discipline. And I ask you to vote no on Senate Bill 6 because you have been made in that image of love, power, and self-discipline. Next, please. Hi, I'm Kimberly Kennedy, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm a freelance writer and a former multicultural educator, and I have a son who's a graduate of UK. Um, I have written extensively on this particular movement, and I do challenge the notion that DEI raises the cost of tuition and that it indoctrinates a liberal ideology. And um, to get more information as well as um, extensive uh, resources on that. You can see my writings at Forward Kentucky. It's a news site. I've given all of you a handout, uh, again, extensively researched, and I'm not going to rehash that. Um, I just want to say that yesterday when I read the new bill, I had sort of an Orwellian moment, and I'm referring to George Orwell's uh, 1984 with the doublespeak where things like freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. It was frightening to me because the bill is saying that diversity, equity, inclusion are discriminatory and divisive, and that's not my experience. So I'm going to tell you a short story. I'm the parent of an adopted daughter from Korea who is also gender dysphoric and uses they, them pronouns, so forgive me when I use those. Hannah arrived at eight months, and we embraced and welcomed the Korean culture into our family. We joined a local organization of adoptive families of Koreans, and we investigated the Korean culture on the surface, music, art, food, traditional costumes, history, even culture camp. We believed by embracing diversity, our daughter would internalize feelings seen, cherished, and included. A friend of mine else also adopted from Korea and chose not to join. The message she gave me is that my son is American and needs to assimilate. My daughter's experience growing up was that no matter how American they were, people saw that they were different. They experienced racist incidents and they internalized being different. Understand that colorblindness is an unattainable aspiration. Now here's where the story gets interesting. The birth mother was found. And all those feelings resurfaced in Hannah about abandonment and rejection and loss of the birth family and the birth country and the big why. And so what was I to say? Stuff your feelings down. You need to assimilate? Of course not. We had performed a deeper dive into the Korea's cultural attitudes surrounding adoption, and so we re revisited these with Hannah. The bloodline is revered. Unwed mothers and children are shunned by much of society. Unwed mothers publicly are labeled and many employers will not hire them. They are unlikely to remarry because most men will not accept a child not of his bloodline. Thus, the options for financial independence are limited and women place their baby for adoption, then remarry and keep the previous child secret. Ms. Candy, I apologize, your time is up which is what Hannah's birth, birth mother chose. So my point is that the benefits um, of the deep dive exploration into education into diversity of culture garners those insights, which means that my daughter could understand and respect and feel compassion and peace around their birth mother's choice. Um, in conclusion, a bill which wants to increase viewpoint diversity should not ban diversity programs thus eliminating the expertise needed to deliver quality content and manage those feelings of students exposed to challenging material. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Jackson, please proceed. Yes, yeah, so since we're here talking about equity, um, I wanna point out that at least one, if not two, uh, legislators asked for me to have scheduled time at the outset of the meeting to speak, to have extended time, and that request was denied, yet we've seen people testify uh, in favor of the bill have extended time. So I will request I have delegated my, time based on the amount of time that those in favor spoke and those have asked to speak against. Both sides are going to have equal time. So, yeah, they, they spoke for more than three minutes is my point. So, speed reading. As elected officials, you all have a critical opportunity in this history to paralyze the cultural and structural violence that is being perpetu perpetuated by sponsors of SB6. 
Minimally, there are three main states of mind that would even support this type of bill. One of general unawareness, one of willful ignorance, and one of ruling class predatory state violence. Speakers are here today to ensure that none of you leave unaware of the threats and the destruction that you will cause if you pass this bill. Look at the landscape. Nationally and statewide, black families are more likely to be investigated by CPS and black children are overrepresented in a child welfare system. Among the United States, Kentucky has the fifth highest felony disenfranchised rate and the eighth highest imprisonment rate. While black and white people comprise 9% and 87% of the state's population respectively, black people are currently imprisoned at a rate three times higher than whites. We know we have predatory policing in black and brown communities across the country and in Kentucky. In our K-12 uh, education system, Kentucky's 22-23 school year revealed that while only representing 11% of the total student population, black students were reported for 32% of the behavioral events. In a racial contrast, white students comprise 71% of the student population, but accounted for 52% of behavioral events. Gender pay gap in Kentucky, women make 21% less than men. Maternal mortality rates here are between 50 and 61 deaths per 100,000 across Hawaiian, black, and American Indian birthing people. It's 20 and lower for white and other racial categories. FBI reports that hate crimes against black people and queer people have increased over the past two years, and they have doubled and tripled in states with laws that have banned race and gender-based education and rights. Why? These data illustrate discriminatory roots, patterns, and outcomes against racially minoritized people, impoverished students, and women, and others found by the U.S. Departments of Education, Justice, and the Health and Human Services, and other entities. Guess what, though? Kentucky has a statutory committee called Commission on Race and Access to Opportunity. Its jurisdiction is to facilitate studies and research issues where disparities may exist across the sectors of education, equity, child welfare, health, economic opportunity, juvenile justice, criminal justice, and other sectors that are deemed relevant in an effort to identify areas of improvement in providing services and opportunities for minority communities. That's a statutory committee. Passing anti-DEI bills is antithetical to this statutory committee. There have been no published impact assessments that you all have done, no publication of disparity research in the areas named by your Commission on Race and Access to Opportunities. These bills are not in response to the historic and current murder and harm imposed onto marginalized people that I've mentioned earlier as a result of navigating systems. Dr. Instead, Jackson, I've already gave you a little lead while your time is up. Okay, Thank you. and the testimony we've seen has been induced predominantly by white feelings of disenfranchisement that allows weaponization of feelings, fear, and lawsuits. Thank you. If you thank you for your testimony. The next three individuals to come forward, please, are Sam Fowler, Robin Newline, and Katie Kleinkoff. If you all please come forward, please. Again, just as a reminder, make sure that those green lights are on on the microphones and make sure the mic is pulled close to you because sometimes it's difficult to pick up. Uh, if you all will introduce yourself for the record and, and then I will administer an oath and you can proceed with your testimony. My name is Dr. Katie Kleinkoff. Robin Newland. Make sure your mic, make sure that green light is on there. Robin Newland. It's not. Oh, thank you. <laughs> would you would you repeat that again for the record? Robin Newland. Okay. Sam Fowler. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Please proceed. Hello, my name is Dr. Katie Kleinkoff. I am a member of the United Campus Workers Union here in Kentucky and a professor at the University of Louisville. I wanna make it clear, however, that I am not speaking today as a representative of the university, but as a concerned private citizen and union member. The claim that SB 6 will ensure intellectual freedom within Kentucky universities is simply untrue. Far from protecting students and creating community, this bill could, among other things, force universities to hire teachers, advisors, and counselors who are Holocaust deniers, who believe that enslavement was good for African Americans and black people, who think that trans people deserve to die based on the simple fact of who they are. This law does not and will not prevent discrimination. Instead, it puts our most vulnerable communities and our most vulnerable students at even greater risk. 
According to Card Analytics, publicly available on UofL's website, the university as a whole is having trouble retaining students, as we've heard about several times today. From 2019 to 2021, UofL only retained 68.1% of this three-year cohort, a grievous problem that SB6 reports to address. It isn't white students who are fleeing the woke campus, however, who are most likely to leave UofL. Instead, it is their black and brown peers. Only 69.4% um, of white students remain, while 63.6% of their Latinx peers remain, and only 59.3% of their black peers do so. Bills like SB6 jeopardize necessary curriculum, programming, and staffing within universities um, in Kentucky that will support these marginalized students and help them to graduate with a college degree. SB6 will only cause greater exodus of students of color and other marginalized students. Moreover, the NAACP and other organizations may issue a travel ban and attendance ban for Kentucky. As we've already seen occur in Florida, the NAACP and their sister organizations may urge black students and families not to attend universities in Kentucky. In universities which are already struggling to attract and maintain students, SB6 could do irreparable harm to the well-being not only of the university systems, but to Kentucky as well. For these reasons and innumerable more, I ask you to vote no on SP6 to protect our students and our staff and faculty workers in universities across the state of Kentucky. Thank you. Whoever's next, please proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> As a white grandmother, mother, and citizen, I feel it is very important to discuss and become aware of unconscious bias, lack of diversity, health disparities, and inclusion issues that are across our city, state, and country. I've learned a lot from several unconscious bias training exercises and find we can be blind to issues if not directly affected ourselves. I feel it is important to educate everyone on the accurate history of our country. We cannot learn from our mistakes if we don't do not know the whole story about the injustices inflicted and suffered by those in Louisville across the state and across America. We cannot fix something if we are unaware that there are issues that are broken. History will be doomed to repeat itself if we do not educate our children and ourselves that no one has a right to devalue another person or race. We should all be equal and should not allow the introduction of bills and laws that take away a person's rights or freedoms. The proposed bills are trying to do away with DEI positions, education, and funding for this important work in our schools and universities. Penalties may be imp imposed on institutions that promote these efforts. Wrongs need to be pointed out addressed and corrected, not continued with abuse of power and negligence of awareness that helps these items get pushed through the legislator. Our country was founded on the principle that all are created equal. People have died to protect this right, but we are going in the wrong direction. I feel it is important to get accurate history taught to our children and grandchildren. It is important to know what is going on in our state and national legislator so that rights may be protected and not taken away. We need to become aware and not wait for someone else to fight these important battles. I would like to add that college students from other states and countries have told me how welcoming we are to them and how much they appreciate this. What if they take their tuition dollars elsewhere? Thank you. Please proceed. Hello, I'm a white, transmasculine, queer Kentuckian, and I have deep alarm for the impacts of this bill will have on our society. Many critical points have been made on the bill so far, so I'll stick with them pieces that I haven't heard yet. This bill, many items remain undefined. These include intellectual diversity, intellectual freedom, and viewpoint diversity. How would these be played out in the system and on across our campuses? This bill incentivizes both the attorney general and individuals to bring civil suits against the city, against the, excuse me, against the universities, further harming the First Amendment that is said to be so cared for. This bill requires a policy of viewpoint neutrality on political and social issues. 
And yet the sponsors of these bills are 100% Republican, 100% Christian, not over 90% male, and 90% white. So where exactly is the neutrality of the goal when the neutrality of the sponsors is not seen? These bills, and I'll use these bills since in the last 24 hours, SB6 has become HB9, are part of a national template created by a few of your first speakers here today, including the Heritage Foundation and the Manhattan Institute. These are national bills playing across this country. They are not coming out of Kentucky, and Kentucky does not need these bills. This is not what Kentuckians want. There has been so much secrecy in the process of these bills that I think if we are going to require something that students learn at orientation, it's the legislative process. Because I would like to know exactly how these bills have already had two readings on the House floor when the House Education Committee has not passed them out of this city. You say you want to hear from students, and yet this whole week where these bills have been moving, every student across the state, nearly every student across the state, is on break. They are home, they are away, and they are not present to hear from me. And finally, if the legislators had a true understanding of what exactly happens in DEI and these spaces recraft, we would have fewer white Americans believing they are the descendants of facilities. Thank you. If the next three individuals uh, I have are James Ritchie, Susan, I believe it's Heaviness, and uh, Ryan Simpson, Simpson. If you will come forward, please. Is this, is this on? <clears throat> Again, just make sure those green lights are on yeah. and the microphones pull close to you. If you all will, when you're ready, please identify yourself for the record, then I'll minister the oath. James Ritchie. Dr. Susan Skees Herms. Herms. Try again. There we go. Ryan Simpson. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please proceed. My name is James Ritchie. Um, my statement will be fairly short. I'd like to say I am here as a private concerned citizen. I'm not representing any organization. I am a PhD student at U of L. I am here on my spring break. Part of my PhD studies include a graduate teaching assistantship in which I teach introduction to film studies. I'm very concerned about the potential lawsuits towards the university, instructors, other individuals. As I teach film studies, there are many, many controversial, divisive, or otherwise unpleasant topics that come up in the history of film. But in order to teach the subject adequately to the best possible academic rigor, it is necessary for me to address these topics in the capacity of my work. I am all for free intellectual debate. That is exactly why I hope you will vote no on this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So my name is Susan Skees Herms. I'm going to be honest. I am nervous because a forum for free speech should allow everybody to feel comfortable. And I'm, I'm not sure that I feel that. But I, I really want to applaud uh, the words of the representative from the Kentucky CPE and those that have spoke in opposition to this version of Senate Bill 6, House Bill 9. Um, it's been concerning since it was introduced. So we've heard some persuasive rhetoric, rhetoric from the selected witnesses speaking in support of this bill. But, but really, why now? And I also ask, why not wait until clear impact research and, uh, and uh, stakeholders that are all impacted have a chance to speak out and be heard? Um, I also ask that, you know, I, um, I'm very concerned. So I speak as a concerned citizen, by the way. Um, and I'm a fourth generation Kentuckian. Um, and I um, I um, received my entry-level education here in Kentucky, but I did receive my post-professional degrees in the Northeast. A very different thinking, very different thinking. But the evidence is just now coming out about the economic damage in these current four states. 
with very similar formulated legislation. My own healthcare background um, with the national conference I'm going to be attending next week and receiving a national award is being boycotted because they picked Orlando five years ago. And we're still trying to figure out how to move forward. Um, and many organizations that are choosing to ride out the COVID penalties for cancellation, they're taking an economic hit. And I, I also have colleagues that have been working in these states in healthcare and in higher education, and they're leaving. They're taking their research agendas, and the students that are that are that used to have high numbers are not choosing these states because especially in healthcare, it's a premium for four decades. We have had DEI training as a provider and it opened the space. It opened the opportunity for trusting conversations. Um, so I, I also, in the back of my head, I keep thinking, you know, the 150th running of the derbies happening. Will that be boycotted? Are we going to see these economic impacts in Kentucky that are happening? Again, why now? Why the push? Um, I have a long set of stories that I'm not going to tell you, but if there's ever an occasion where I can have extensive reporting, we only discovered like the last 15 years that my, my brother, my youngest brother is the youngest son of the youngest son of the youngest son of a slave owner. We did not talk about that for two decades. And to have open conversation is something that education allows us. So my last uh, phrase is um, grow, um, change is inevitable. Growth is a choice. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, please. Um, I'm also a little nervous and a little cold. You all keep it freezing in here. I'll say that much. Um, so uh, hello and thank you for being here and listening to the various perspectives on this bill. I'm um, Ryan Simpson. I'm a resident of Jefferson County. I'm not here today speaking on behalf of any institution or organization. I'm here just um, on my own behalf. Um, but what I am speaking from is uh, 15 years of experience doing diversity and equity work in various forms of, in higher education. Um, in the Commonwealth and uh, another decade of experience working in nonprofits that address health equity issues. Um, I feel like there's, and I'm hearing, definitely some misunderstandings about uh, this kind of work at colleges and universities. Um, and I believe there will be consequences from this bill that may not be fully known or appreciated. I also want to take a moment as we're talking about diversity, the lack of diversity of the sponsors of these bills. Um, which, again, I don't know the percentages of each, but are predominantly or 100% white. Um, I'm, it doesn't look bipartisan, um, and I don't know the religious identities of all, but um, it does not seem very diverse perspectives going into this bill. Um, so talking, uh, some of the roles that I have served in in DEI positions um, um, is not that of an administrator or a researcher, but as a staff member who constantly interacts with staff, uh, students, faculty, um, residents, et cetera. Um, in my experience, the majority of this work um, that is being done is to help these individuals thrive in school and work, our workplaces to make them better. Um, so it could be helping prepping for graduate school applications, finding resources to pay for tuition, assistance with conflicts with coworkers, exploring the ways to reduce the many health disparities that we have in our commonwealth, um, or helping ensure individuals feel like they belong um, in college, in dental school, or whatever path they hope to follow. We absolutely assist those who are feeling isolated, harassed, currently and historically underrepresented, and we should be supporting these individuals. Um, and we assist everyone who walks in our doors regardless of identity. I'm a white, straight, middle-aged male, uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion includes me as well. The individuals in DEI, DEI offices are the ones fighting for students from rural areas, for veterans, neurodivergent students, first-generation students, Pella-eligible students, just to name a few. So when this bill says terminate all DEI positions, these include the people who run these resource centers and who do all of these programs, help run federal and uh, programs as well that have these intentions. The purpose of this bill from my perspective is not to create jobs, improve education, or address our many health disparities, which there are many. I fear it will cause quite the opposite. Um, it does call for terminations of positions of taxpaying Kentuckians and their families will be impacted as well. So take, keep that in mind. Um, those at universities will lose their jobs. I am worried about students not coming to our state. 
Um, and we will continue to have some of the worst health outcomes in the U.S. if we aren't actively talking about them and addressing them. When I'm traveling out of Kentucky to recruit students, it takes a lot to come overcome some of the negative myths about our state, which just aren't true. And I fear this will make it hard. I apologize, but your time is up. I will just say um, um, that I, I'm very worried about what the impacts of this bill. That will make it harder for um, us to do our work as educators, and I'm asking you to vote no on this bill. Okay. Thank you all for your presentations today. Uh, our last three people who have signed up to speak are, I believe it's Marion Vassar. I believe it's, I apologize, is it Lisa or Tish Gundeman? And Representative Daniel Grossberg. Again, just make sure those green lights are on in front of you. And, and when you're ready, please identify yourself for the record. I will go. I'm Marion Vassar, um, and I'm here as a private citizen. Okay. Lisa Gunterman, private citizen. Daniel Grossberg, representative, 30th district. Okay. Whoever wants to go forward uh, first, please proceed. Well, then I'm going to go. Um, and, and I'm going to cut out a lot of my comments because most of what I was going to say has already been said. But I want to start with a quote. Um, by psychologist Joy DeGruy, um, who says America's pathology is her denial. Um, and what she means in that quote is we are sick as a country and more specifically as a commonwealth because we're not always operating on truth. Um, I would argue that the tactics enforced and the blatant lies that have been told today further support the need for effective DEI work in education. Um, this is how racism and oppression continue to thrive um, with lies. Um, as I review the bills here and hear the various speakers flat out lie, it is crystal clear that most speakers have not even attended an effective DEI educational session. For example, um, how we are defining marginalized students, that includes students with disabilities, that includes students who are Jewish. Um, that includes a lot of the students they, that they are saying are not served um, in this work. This bill literally works against the best interests of the entire economy, um, literally tanking the economy in preparation for 2045. Um, because we know who the middle class will be in 2045, and these bills actively work to set them up not to be able to occupy that position successfully. Um, as a DEI practitioner of over 20 years, I cannot relate to anything that was shared by the naysayers. Um, they failed to share the magic that happens in this work, um, but you would actually have to engage in the work to know the magic that comes out of it. Um, I have seen relationships um, being built across difference. Um, I myself am engaging with people who hold different political affiliations, different religious affiliations in very productive ways, and those are people that I would not have engaged with previously without the skills that I learned in the DEI space. So I am developing new relationships across difference because of the work um, and the skill set that I learned um, doing this work. Um, none of what was discussed in these bills, again, have I witnessed. I've been in higher ed for 30 plus years. And again, I cannot relate to any of what was shared. Um, that is not what I'm seeing day to day. Um, I work daily with all students. Every student that, in, that comes across my, um, my desk um, and that I engage with, I help. I don't stop and say, what identities do you hold? Because I can only serve a few. All students get assisted. Um, so what I'm hearing, and, and I heard some people say that they're scared things may happen. I am actively hearing from students who are planning to leave, not talking about it, planning to leave Kentucky. Um, parents vowing not to send their children to schools in Kentucky. Employers saying that they will not recruit from Kentucky schools. Donors saying that they will withdraw their funding. And yes, I know of at least one high profile person that said they will not support the Kentucky Derby if this bill passes. Um, and I'll just I, leave you, you with- could, If you could wrap it up. Please. I will. I'll just leave you with this, um, just to further demonstrate the beauty that comes out of DEI work. If you can look at the proponents, very diverse group across differences. If you look at the naysayers, well, do the math. Thank you. Okay. Whoever wants to go next, please proceed. 
I knew I shouldn't have gone after uh, Dr. Vassar here. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here today. You've heard a lot of statistics. You've heard from people who are academics and from me as a private concerned citizen. I'm also the parent of two boys. Uh, when I looked at the bill, I just saw a word salad. I'm going to be honest, I didn't quite get. Um, we were talking about we're not going to allow this, but we do want to allow freedom of thought, but we're not going to allow this type of freedom of thought. So I'm just going to be honest, I was a little bit confused by this. Um, I'm also coming to as a fifth generation Kentuckian while I hail from Jefferson County. My grandmother, born in 1910, hailed from a farm outside of what's now called Bowling Green. One of the lessons I learned from my grandmother was leave a place better than you found it. Whether that meant pick up, picking up trash while we're out on a hike, helping relatives clean up after a family gathering, or volunteering in my local community, it was important to her that we made a difference. I'm sure when each of you were asked about your why when it came to running for office, you answered that you wanted to leave this state better than when you found it when you first took office. Senate Bill 6 does just the opposite, and I respectfully ask you to vote no for a couple of reasons. The first, a wise person once said, we all do better when we all do better. We know from data that when students feel like they belong, they succeed. Kentuckians deserve to see their college students succeed and walk across that graduation stage. They deserve to have us all applauding for them and their success. We need more support for Kentucky's young people, not less. And number two, Kentuckians deserve a vibrant economy and competitive employment opportunities. We know from data that companies are hesitant to relocate to states like Kentucky that have passed or are considering passing measures like this. And as a proud Kentuckian, like I'm sure many of you are, I have traveled outside this state and heard people make fun of us and talk about us behind our back and in front of our back. This, a bill like this does not help. We live in a global community. It is on each of us to prepare our students and young people to compete in this economy. And that means we increase their knowledge of diversity, equity, and inclusion, not decrease it. I guarantee you that if we don't do it, other states will. They will recruit our best and brightest and they won't return to our state. Kentuckians are concerned about how to pay their bills. They're worried about their health care. They're worried about their children having a bright future. When they go to bed tonight, they are not thinking about DEI. They're thinking about how do I keep the lights on and do I have health care in my job? The idea that we are spending taxpayer dollars on such a divisive bill rather than uplifting all Kentuckians is contrary to our state motto, which is united we stand, divided we fall. I encourage you to remember your why and vote no on HB6. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Grossberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm speaking to you here today as the only practicing Jew in the Kentucky House of Representatives and I'm countering the speech given prior by another Jew who claims that DEI advocates the oppressor-oppressed binary that has leveraged anti-Semitism throughout history. Let me be clear. This legislation is opposed by both the Jewish Federation of Louisville and the Jewish Federation of the Bluegrass. I'm speaking right now on their behalf, as well as the people of the 30th District, which is demographically the most diverse district in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We do not wish to see one group of marginalized people pitted against another. You are all aware of a number of anti-Semitic incidents recently here in Kentucky, many of which took place on college campuses. Some were even committed by faculty. I've shared a fraction of those incidents with you and statements from the students and faculty who often feel unsupportive. I have countless personal stories as well that I could share with you at a later time. So do we have problems? Absolutely. Are people left out? Absolutely. But the solution is to fix the systems in place. We should expand the definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We should require further protections of more marginalized people. These programs, DEI, give people who have been marginalized, made to feel less than, a place to be supported. A place to meet their unique needs that large institutions unintentionally overlook consistently. Should that include Jews? Absolutely, and we can fix that. So I ask you to ask yourself, 
How were you supported or not supported when you were on campus? What would it have meant to have a team of folks working with you to make sure that you felt at home? What I've been hearing through this policy is ironically a defund the police mentality from the majority party. We all agree that crime exists, but that means that we should invest more in crime prevention using empirically tested techniques. Just as we all agree that hate based on racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and homophobia all exist, we should invest in empirically tested techniques to address these issues as well. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming out and providing your viewpoints today. Representative Decker, would you like to come back to the table, please? We do have some questions from some members. First off, I'd like to give you an opportunity if you'd like to respond to any of the comments that have been made. Um, well, I had just a closing statement, but I can wait till after questions. Okay. I apologize. Get this off here. First question is from Representative Bojanowski. Thank you. May I ask a question, please? Proceed. All right. Let me get to the right page here. Okay, so I read the bill. I read the bill again. I reread the bill. I read the sub and read it again, and I'm confused. So, um, and I want to just kind of bring in three different parts, and if you could help me understand the intent of the bill. So under discriminatory concepts, you define presenting as truth rather than a subject for inquiry that an existing structure system or relation of power, privilege, or subordination persists on the basis of oppression, colonialism, socioeconomic status, religion, race, sex, color, or national origin. All right, so it gets me thinking, well, if you can't have discriminatory concepts, maybe you can't teach those concepts. But then on page eight, it does state that academic course content or instruction and academic freedom of faculty, students, and student organizations are notwithstanding. So then I'm like, okay. But then on page 19, um, where it says the council shall not approve a new degree certificate or diploma program that includes a requirement for a course or training dedicated to the promotion or justification of discriminatory concepts, then I'm concerned once again that even though the professors may not be able to, um, may not have their academic freedom um, blocked, we won't be allowed to have programs that have courses that might potentially violate the discriminatory concepts. So could you just be helpful in explaining what can't be taught, if anything, and are there any programs that currently exist that the Council for Post-Secondary Education would have to stop um, because they require a course dedicated to the promotion or justification of discriminatory concepts? Thank you for the question. I've heard that question often. I'd be happy to address it. So the definition of discriminatory concepts is one that is in a, a, a presentation that does not allow debate. There is it, a topic is presented as true, and then that is the, the only concept that is discussed. There can be no discussion. I'll give you an example. There was a class I uh, was told about that the, the concept, and I've seen this written in books um, as well, there's a concept that the Civil Rights Act was, was written to promote white supremacy and that it was an act of white supremacy. And so the, the assignment was, where do you find white supremacy in the inaction, in, enactment of the Civil Rights Act? And the, the lessons were on how the Congress, the, con the congressmen and women who passed the Civil Rights Act were white supremacists whose careers were in danger, who were being called racist. And so this, the, the, they found white supremacy in that they passed the bill to save their careers. That in, that in truth, it was unpopular with the Congress person's 
um, constituency, except there was a movement that was beginning to erode their popularity. So it was a, a many ways in which the Civil Rights Act was not presented as uh, furtherance of the constitutional promise of equal opportunity, but it was an act of white supremacy. So that would not have been welcomed in the class that the, any discussion of, of that not being true, it was presented as a fact, as true, without, not as a, a subject of inquiry. And that is the only thing that is not allowed in this bill is for something to be taught without allowing debate. I heard just last week from a family whose daughter was in a class for uh, a gender studies, and they were studying genders. And the teacher was teaching, as it was told to me, that there were five genders. And so the child, the, the student, commented that she thought there were two genders. And the teacher, I think she recorded the class, and she's going to send me a copy of the recording, but it was that the, the child was berated by the teacher and was not allowed to go further. Her class members told her just to, just to go along and just to be quiet and just take the class. When she was asked to write a paper, she wrote her beliefs and she failed the class. So that is the type of, of class. It shocks me that such things exist. That is the only thing that is disallowed here. So when it talks about classes, um, that this this is just a it is not banning anything in the first section but then when it so it we added the academic freedom teachers can teach anything they want on any topic we hope they will but they have to allow open and honest debate in the class and so when the council for post secondary um, education reviews programs they are to look at whether the classes are offered as uh, topics of debate and of free inquiry, of discussions. No class is, is banned. No books are banned. No concept is banned. I think some of the comments today were on, on Senate Bill 6, not, House, not Senate Bill as, a, as, as amended by the committee sub. So in answer to your question, have I answered your question? I, I, I could actually add something to it if I may. And I, Please I, make I think, sure your microphone's on, Mr. Fraser. I, th I think that um, okay. I think you've answered that Thank question. You. If I okay. may speak yeah. on the bill, go ahead. I'm cognizant of time, so I do want to bring to attention the last time I looked, there are 59 anti-diversity equity bills in 25 states, and. Um, you know, from my perspective, this isn't a Kentucky-based initiative, and having Heritage Foundation and Manhattan Institute as guest speakers just drove that home to me. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are about creating a more open and inclusive campus environment for those who live, learn, and work on those campuses. The goal of the programs is to provide targeted inputs to people who may be underrepresented, who may historically struggle, or who may not have had the same opportunities to help them be successful in higher education. Equity is an effort to ensure equal opportunity, not equal results. Not everyone starts in the same place or is in the same circumstances. This, less, this legislation will have a chilling effect on administration's efforts to address rampant mistreatment of minorities, women, LGBTQ students, and faculty on campus. Yet the very first line of defense, which is proactive efforts against discrimination, would not exist. Thank you. Next, we have Representative Josh Calloway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Decker, for your work on this bill. I have listened today and heard a lot about what this bill may do if it is uh, actually voted in uh, to, and becomes law. Um, I've seen some just some recent studies and surveys from what is actually happening right now. Students that say things like, as a Christian, I feel like my values are not respected on campus and are in fact actively advocated against. And this was actually a diversity survey that was done 
my son um, had a professor that in a class that he was in in a college here in the state. Uh, the professor actually told him that they send, he was a diversity, equity, and inclusion trained professor, and that they send students to his class to teach the, those students to not vote Republican. Um, he brought up the concern, uh, was immediately shut down. So if this bill is voted in and bec becomes law, what may it do for those students experience well the bill does ask and require professors to be politically neutral uh, and to not express such opinions as that the bill does allow a student who who has felt that way to bring a suit for either injunction injunctive relief or to uh, and, and that that's what is now in the bill, they so it is an enforcement mechanism that they now have that they didn't have before. You finished, Representative Callaway. Representative Bauman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Decker, and to all the guests that uh, testified here today. Representative, uh, I I'm curious. Uh, if you yourself have visited any of these DEI offices, operations, and if not, why not? If you have, can you tell us a little bit about what you learned? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I have, and in fact, I was just really impressed and um, just impressed by the, the, one of the things that I saw was how the student centers are serving students how they um, stand ready at all times to help students with whatever their problems they are, the safe spaces they provide. They are not covered by the bill, they are exempted from the bill because they are doing the kind of work that I think Representative Bojanowski was hoping that would be done on the campuses. I saw that. I saw the safe spaces they provide for students just to, if they feel um, uncomfortable on campus, they can come in there and there's, there's spaces they can sleep, they can eat, they can study. Um, and I saw the care that the, that the uh, center directors had for their students. Uh, I did visit D a DEI office on one of the same campuses that I had visited all of those spaces. And I asked if, if that office had much in, in interaction with students and the answer was no that in fact sometimes students do make appointments with the DEI officers but they don't have many students come in which is exactly what I have been told by students what we heard from one of the students today an MLK scholar um, and so it was a, an eye-opening experience actually thank you thank you for asking and, and if I may we do have student experiences we do have qualitative measures when it comes to this the Council for post-secondary education is charged to evaluate this this is part of their diversity equity and inclusion plans the campuses are charged and in fact the I believe that the study that was read by, uh, read by representative Callaway came from the 2019 NKU DEI campus climate survey as required underneath the promulgations of the DEI plans and also 13 KAR 2.060 by the by the Kentucky Council of Post-Secondary Education. So when we talk about, and some of the claims here is that we need to have qualitative studies, that is the duty of the Council of Post-Secondary Education. This is their job, so we have them. We also have their DEI plans, we also have DEI rubrics, and we also have, and according to our Attorney General, how it's sometimes under-inclusive in certain terms and applications as well. So we do have evaluations, and some of that's unique that it comes to because when spending nine months on building legislation, and we do have a situation here, we do have, as one of my uh, most, what one of my heroes and starch First Amendment advocates have said, uh, we all have biases. It's our job to recognize them and move through them. That's an Edward Ard Merrill quote, uh, who I do love. Um, we do have something unique in Kentucky where we do have an evaluation of all KCTC and also DEI officers and their experience in a dissertation by Dr. Tolliver. So we do have that information here with us. 
The next question or comment comes from Representative Raymond. Thank you. Um, Representative Decker, is diversity, equity, and inclusion like a trademarked product that is sold by a company that our universities have purchased and are distributing on their campuses? DEI is defined in the bill. Anytime a bill is offered, a law is proposed, definitions have to be provided so that we know what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. So what this bill deals with are initiatives that provide preferences for protected classes that are not offered in general. It, it is the Constitution that is at play here. May I ask another question? Proceed. I read on page 10 of the sub that each governing board of a university should adopt a policy on viewpoint neutrality that prohibits discrimination on the basis of an individual's political or social viewpoint. Mm -hmm. What about a straight up Nazi? I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. So in the sub I read on page 10 that each governing board of a university mm -hmm must adopt a policy on viewpoint neutrality that prohibits discrimination on the basis of an individual's political And I want to know, what about a straight up Are you Nazi? asking that, that whether that is something that can be uh, allowed on campus, a Nazi mentality? Mm -hmm. OK, there should be adopted a policy that would, uh, that would, uh, that would promote and enforce viewpoint neutrality. I believe Nazism is a, is a discriminatory concept in that it's offered without debate as true. May I ask another question? One yes. more, please. I read on page 27 of the sub that each university must develop a strategy um, for attracting and retaining faculty members with diverse perspectives and points of view. That sounds to me like, like diversity, equity, and inclusion by another name aimed at a different population. How is it not? Diversity, equity, and inclusion that is uh, at play in this bill and that is regulated is defined. And, and it is not the inclusion of various viewpoints. It is not asking people different, to have different viewpoints. It's not encouraging different viewpoints. It's doing the opposite. It's, it's proposing ideas without debate. So what you read on page 27 is the opposite of that. It is encouraging different viewpoints. So it's the exact opposite of, of the diversity, equity, and inclusion that is defined in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the audience, please refrain from reactions to comments, please. We're here to conduct the business of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Next, we have uh, Representative Rayburn. Let's go to Representative Massaroni. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative, or my career, the one, is this model legislation, is this a cucky cutter? Cutter, moderate legislation. Sorry, I've got tongue tied there. So I did. I did not start with a model legislation. I gave the concepts that I wanted to talk about with the bill writer. Whether she looked at model legislation, I don't know. It is not a cookie cutter. It is not. You can't find legislation like this. It deals with Kentucky CPE that doesn't exist anywhere else. Thank it you. It looks at our system and <coughs> seeks to. Uh, to to uh, to stop the discriminatory practices. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Representative uh, Emily Callaway is next. Thank you, Chairman. And I also want to thank you for your patience during this meeting, uh, the level of disrespect of which I have rarely seen, <clears throat> um, especially when that gavel drops. So I appreciate your patience uh, and your respect and for allowing all the voices to be heard even the disrespectful ones. So um, I want to th thank you to the sponsors the, and Michael. I, the thoroughness to which you, you have presented research, um, testimony, 
is just remarkable. And I appreciate the months and months of work that you've put into this. Um, and, you know, as, as witnessed today, it, it does seem like DEI programs, it teaches to profile a group of individuals based on their skin color and political leaning um, and declare us not diverse enough. Um, would, would you say discriminatory presumptions are one thing that this bill works to combat? Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, that is the point of the bill. We want to seek diversity of viewpoint. We want to look past the color of the skin. We, we don't want to look at people in that way. We want our institutions to encourage people to share ideas instead of groupthink. Thank you. Next is Representative Doan. Uh, thank you. I, I've got in my possession here a, um, an attorney general's opinion that was rendered today. Um, and what it, it looks at is um, the definition of underrepresented minorities with respect to how the Council on Post-Secondary uh, Education defines that. And what the opinion bases itself off is Fair Admissions Incorporated uh, versus Harvard University. And one of the issues in that 2023 case was looking at is how Harvard treated uh, an, un an underrepresented minority, how it treated Asian students. And um, what the Supreme Court found is that the discriminatory practices of not allowing Asian students um, the same advantages that other unrepresented, underrepresented minorities uh, were given were found to be unconstitutional under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and I guess my question is probably to Mr. Frazier. Uh, during your investigation of these issues and, and the Council on Post-Secondary Education here in Kentucky, uh, did you ever look at how the Council on Post-Secondary Education treats Asian students here in Kentucky? I, I have, but I think that that might be a good question for Mr. Powell, who's in the room. Um, I, if counsel is here present, I think that that would be more appropriate. Mr. But yes, Fraser, it does. I was getting ready to call Mr. Powell the table to address yeah. that issue. Thank you. And, and if I may say, this has been a thorough investigation, or should I say a, a review, if I may put that, um, with uh, Representative Decker. And because of the, uh, the, the points that have been identified, while we might have certain characteristics, this bill has been reviewed by students across Kentucky over the past nine months. Members, I believe you all were given a packet earlier. There's a copy of that Kentucky Journal, uh, Attorney General's opinion in that packet. Uh, Mr. Powell, would you uh, please offer some perspective on this ruling? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Representative Doan. Um, just obviously had a chance to look at it. It's, it's hot off the press. Um, but to your question about Asian students, so we look at Asian students when we're talking about overall diversity on our campuses. Uh, but when we're talking about student success and underrepresented minorities, uh, Asians are left out of that population because if you look at the achievement gaps in student success, uh, Asian students tend to perform on a higher level than the overall population. So we're looking to close those achievement gaps and where we find those are with underrepresented minorities, uh, not including uh, Asian and with low income students. One, one follow up, please. I mean, that's the same thing that Harvard was doing that was found to be unconstitutional, correct? No, Harvard's case was about admissions. Uh, admissions to the university um, and not and, and that was only the only thing that it was it had applied to now obviously you can read that decision and see that it may apply in other scenarios but that uh, that decision was based on admissions and and uh, uh, Harvard had a priority for uh, for non-Asian students in their admissions um, it's a very selective uh, institution as you know obviously um, Kentucky doesn't have a selective institution like that. Uh, most of our institutions, I don't want to say they're completely open enrollment, but we, uh, UK, for example, has about a 97% acceptance rate. So we tend to not have those issues on, on admissions, but the, the Harvard case was about admissions. But if I may follow up with that, CPE does rank and also evaluate through ranges through performance-based funding. Performance-based funding obviously does incentivize certain, certain incentives when it comes to admissions, scholarships, and university practices. And that's reflected in the DEI plans, which is required to be submitted and reviewed by the Council for <coughs> Post-Secondary Education. You have a comment, Representative Decker? Yes, I did. I actually requested that advisory opinion. I asked four questions. And one of them is, 
whether the uh, the performance-based funding is unconstitutional because it does uh, have metrics in there about um, underrepresented minority uh, performance, which you have to be admitted. And it, it asked four questions, and all of the four questions involved in the answer was, every time you see a metric of un, uh, rep, of um, of race exclusive requirements, it is unconstitutional, which while the Harvard case did um, answer admission, that was one of the questions about the performance-based funding, which would require admission scrutiny. Uh, go ahead, Thank Mr. You. Powell, briefly. Thank you. Uh, and again, we're still reviewing the opinion. Uh, I'll just say that, uh, first off, I'll mention on the uh, URM definition is consistent with the federal definition when, for reporting to, and that doesn't include Asian. I just wanted to follow. I remember that after I told you, and I wanted to mention that too. Uh, but as far as the AG opinion goes, um, you know, we're still reviewing it, obviously, and seeing what next steps we need to take. But I will say that uh, any um, the case at Harvard, you know, any case in controversy requ re requires um, injury for the individual and tracking progress and metrics towards underrepresented minorities or closing achievement gaps based on race doesn't require any institution to discriminate against any students. Okay. Our last question from the day is going to come from Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Listening to the testimony and the conversation that we've had heretofore that the proponents of this legislation have had a lot more time to to discuss and to to put their points out there there are some of the opponents of the legislation and i would like to have a couple of them come back to the table for q a representative brown uh, i time the amount of time that the people who who support the legislation had i gave equal time to the individuals who uh, were against the legislation. It just so happened there were a lot more of them. So that's why we had to limit their debate. But we did have fair time for both sides of this debate. I disagree, Mr. Chairman. And I think that I would like that recorded because some of the people that spoke, Dr. Jackson was cut off. Ms. Vassar was cut off. And I think they were making very valid points. And there were other valid points that were being made about the opposition to, to this piece of legislation. It, it has come out just, just in the last couple of minutes that this bill has been under um, preparation or being prepared for the last nine months. We just got this in the last week, too, that, that it is problematic to me that this is where we are in terms of this bill. And, and the point was made by the opponents of, to this legislation that there was much more time given to the proponents of the legislation than there were to the opponents of the legislation. And I think that, that Kentucky will be making a serious mistake to pass such a piece of legislation because DEI came, in my opinion, as a result of something being wrong, not something being right. And we still have the wrongs. And what we're talking about perpetuating here is perpetuating the wrong by passing a piece of legislation that is that is, that is way out of pocket in terms of what is best for the Commonwealth of Kentucky and what is best for the United States of America. So I, I, I would really like to throw my hands up and walk out on this piece, walk out on this vote and on this committee. But I will wait and I'll pass, I, I will cast my vote on this legislation because it is wrong. It is ill-conceived. It is not positive for the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I hope that the people of the Commonwealth will see clearly what we have done or what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the beginning of the meeting, as I do every meeting, I announce that additional testimony is at the discretion of the chair based on available time and testimony that's already been given. Mariah, call the roll. Representative Baker? Yes. Representative Ballman? Yes. Representative Bojanowski? No. Representative Brown? No. Representative Emily Calloway? Yes. Representative Josh Calloway? Yes. Representative Decker? Yes. Representative Doan? Yes, ma'am. Representative Jackson? Explain my vote, please. Proceed. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm concerned about testimony I've heard on both sides of the issue today. 
Uh, I think we've got a major problem here uh, on both sides of this issue. I think you both think uh, that you're right and you're passionate about what you're doing, and I think probably there could be a little compromise somewhere uh, in the middle. But after talking to Senator Wilson this morning, he didn't know uh, what had happened to his Senate Bill 6. I'm going to pass today to try to find out more information uh, about this bill. Representative Lewis? Pass. Representative Masseroni? Yes. Representative McCool? Yes. Representative Rayburn? Yes. Representative Rawlings? Yes. Representative Raymond? I vote no, and I want to acknowledge that the Kentucky State Capitol is located on the traditional territory of the Osage, Cherokee, Adena, Shawnee, and Hopewell, who were displaced by white settlers. Representative Riley? Uh, explain my vote. Proceed. Uh, first thing I want to mention is that um, a comment was made earlier that uh, about bias incident training and that Western Kentucky University was part of that. Whether you agree with bias incident training or not, Western Kentucky University does not have that in their in their program. So I just want to get that out uh, for a clarification. Um, Representative Jackson mentioned uh, we don't talk to each other. We talk around each other. And we all, we all struggle. We all struggle with our own personal biases. We all do. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all struggle with that. Um, and it's, you know, my dad taught me when I was growing up, when, you, when you're pointing one finger at somebody else, you got three of them pointing back at you. And so we, we all, all struggle with this. Um, I, I think we need to have more discussion on this. I'm going to vote yes to, to go ahead and get it through. But I think we need to have more discussion on this and, and realize that it's important for all of us um, to show grace, humility, respect to everyone um, and until until we get these issues solved we cannot become the nation that we're capable of being um, and and I think all of us in struggle with this internally we don't always express that but I think all of us as human beings have to struggle with this internally about where we are uh, at this point in time in our nation in our commonwealth, in our hometowns, and in our daily life. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Timoney? Representative Truitt? Yes. Representative Wilner? Chair Tipton? Chair votes yes. Okay. Senate Bill 6 is amended by primary House Substitute 2 with 13 yes votes, three no votes, and two pass votes. Passes for favorable expression. The same should pass on the House floor. Meetings adjourned.